So it's something that's really, you know, coming to fold now, and you're, we're hearing a lot more about it, but I, I still feel like not everyone is really on board with it, maybe, or, or, or maybe not everyone's really interested in, in maybe practicing it. Um, why is that? Why might that be? I think just as it is with anything that's new that we've discovered, especially in the science realm, it's a little bit um, difficult to get everybody on board and adopt to the new ideology. But there have been evidence-based studies that have shown um, that we have treatment options to prevent the progression of myopia. So we're talking about identifying progression in younger children to prevent more of um, the anatomical consequences. So it's not necessarily about stopping the increase in the number of their prescription, but we're, we're concerned more about their health risks. Yeah, so, I mean, we'll talk about treatment and we'll talk about identifying patients and, and talking to patients and parents and, and everything else in between. But before we do that, if I wanted to learn a little bit more about myopia mm -hmm. control and methods and studies, I mean, where's the best place to look for that? I mean. It, it, maybe it's just a Google search. I don't, you know, is there a is there a place right now that has this information, or is that something that maybe we need? I think you can always start with a Google search. There are definitely studies and articles available online. I personally learned the most recently through a continuing education course um, through an organization out in Northern Virginia. So that's when I really got interested in it and learned a lot of information there. So yeah, just be out on the lookout. Okay, so let's talk about some of the treatment options. I feel like every time that I look up myopia control, I, I, I see about bifocal, bifocals, oh no, bifocals are no good. ortho -okay. oh well, you know, atropine's better. Or, you know what, well, we don't know about the long-term effects of atropine. And it's just, it, it, sometimes it can be overwhelming, a little bit confusing. You know, what, what's out there, what are some treatment options, and which one is showing to be the best so far? So that's a great question because it can be overwhelming and, and where do I go from here? But really there have been three uh, tried and true treatment options that um, we work with. So there are diluted atropine drops. We can also use soft multifocal contact lenses or we can use orthokeratology lenses. And, and which of those three seems to be the front runner for uh, yeah, efficacy? It really depends. I mean, they're all, they all really provide great outcomes and have um, proven to halt progression. So it really depends on the patient. So with younger patients who may not be compliant with, let's say, orthokeratology, then maybe we'll go diluted atropine because that's something the parent can control and the child really doesn't have anything to do about it once they're dilated, right? Um, whereas an older, maybe early teenage patient, we could fit them into multifocal contacts or orthokeratology. And what would you say is your go-to? I mean, what is your first uh, preference in terms of choosing a treatment option? Like you said, it can depend uh, on the patient. Uh, there's some things that you need to take into consideration, of course, but all that aside, I mean, for you, what have you seen the most success with? What would you recommend? I personally think just because we're dealing with a younger um, patient group, I prefer using 0.05% atropine drops. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, optometrists may be kind of hesitant with that because of the effects of atropine, that kind of thing. But if you look at some studies, um, 0.05 atropine hasn't really had um, too many consequences or negative effects. And I think that's the only way that we can be sure that um, the child is compliant, you know, if the parent is putting in the drops, then we're good to go. Um, there's nothing that we can, that the child can do to mess that up. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about, uh, for the optometrists out there who want to start practicing myopia control, and, you know, the first thing to do is information, have the information, understand the options, uh, maybe have a protocol, and I'm not sure that there is a protocol per se, but maybe it's a protocol that you develop for yourself, right? What are the first steps to, to start bringing that to your practice? So you want to make sure that you're able to adequately identify progression, right? And so the at the most simple step, it's just seeing change in the numbers. So maybe if they're progressing 0.75 diopter or more within a year, that's clearly progression. 
And then the second steps would be um, utilizing equipment such as an A-scan or a Pentacam because really the way that we're, when we're talking about myopia progression, we're talking more so about the axial length of the eye, not necessarily the numbers, like I said. So we're talking about the anatomical changes. So you really wanna make sure that you have that type of equipment. And if you don't, then you know you can talk or um, try to co-manage with other practices that yeah. do have that. It's almost like, well, you know, I want to practice myopia control, but man, I don't have, you know, I don't want to go buy more equipment. I don't have that stuff. I mean, can you still effectively manage myopia, um, say using atropine, say using these other methods, even without an A scan? You know, maybe you're not measuring actually, maybe you're just looking at the numbers and that doesn't tell the whole story, of course, but can you still do that? Or is it kind of like, well, if you don't, then you're not really doing a full service to the patient? So a lot of researchers in myopia control and um, professionals that really practice in um, uh, progression or controlling it really encourage you to either be all or nothing. Don't just dabble in myopia control because we're dealing with um, children and we really want to make sure that we're, we're doing all the right things and, and doing uh, due diligence. So. I would recommend at least being, if you don't have the equipment, at least being able to identify um, progression and educating the patient and bringing awareness to them and the parent saying, hey, this is something that we can potentially um, halt and here's the information and here's where you can go. At least getting them to where they need if you don't have the equipment. Okay, so you sold me on getting some equipment. So I'm upgrading, I'm gonna go out and buy this equipment and I wanna start, I'm gonna really go all in on this. After I've got everything and I've got my protocol, I've got the knowledge, how do I, number one, start talking to patients and parents about it? How do you identify candidates for this? And is there an age range? Is there a certain age range you're looking at? Um, mm -hmm. um, so, like I mentioned at the very beginning, I am personally kind of touched by uh, myopia control just because you know, it's in my family and I've seen kind of the consequences of letting it progress. I just mentioned to the child and the, more so to the patient, I mean, if you're, you know, if a mother or father's there and you're like, hey, we can make your child a little bit more, um, less risk adverse for A, B, and C, retinal tears, detachments, myopic macular degeneration, that kind of thing. And if you're, you know, telling a parent that they're most likely gonna wanna do the best for their child, Two, we identify it. So if you, let's say you don't have any equipment, just on the um, refractive changes, you can identify progression, then of course send them out for an evaluation, um, checking their axial length and uh, tomography, that kind of thing. The professionals that I've talked to that really treat myopia full scope, and that's all they do, they treat up until age 18. So I wanna say, I mean, I, I really look at kids under 15. If you're 15 to 18, I mean, it's hard to say how much more you'll progress. If they're really high myop, I'll still say, hey, let's go get you checked out. Um, so it really depends. Now, do you ever get from patients, you know, probably parents more than patients, especially dealing with children, you know, can't we just change his glasses? I mean, is it really necessary to have to do this? I mean, how much is this gonna cost? I mean, how do you, how do you have that conversation with parents? I mean, you educate them obviously on, on importance, but is there, you know, is there anything that you can do to, to go that extra mile to convince these maybe somewhat hesitant parents to kind of start to uh, adopt this? So I really don't personally talk, speak about the cost. I know a lot of this right now isn't really covered by insurance. It's not FDA approved, but it is proven to show that we have stopped uh, a lot of nearsightedness. Um, I think just educating them on the importance of this and the possibilities and how you can protect your child by at least getting them evaluated and at least the uh, management company, the management practice that I work with, they provide free evaluation. So there's no harm in at least getting them checked out. Um, and of course, I have the personal story of my sibling and you know I would have done anything, paid any amount of money to um, get him you know, to prevent that from happening. Yeah, I get, that's a really good point. Having that personal sort of story, that personal experience to share oftentimes really um, resonates with patients when it, whenever you share those things. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about, um, you know, marketing this? Is there a certain marketing you need to do for this or is it just something, a discussion that happens in the exam room? 
Or maybe that's where it starts. Um, right now, I think it's, um, I mean, I think a lot of the um, big name companies in the industry are doing very well with kind of getting this buzzword out, myopia control. But in the practice, I mean, right now, it's for me, it's still conversational. And I think, you know, a lot of patients are not necessarily familiar with it. You really do have to have that conversation. A lot of, some patients don't even know that they are myopic. They know they're some of them barely know they're nearsighted. So I think we, you know, we've got a long way to go, but definitely in the exam rooms, I think most important right now. Yeah, and, and so once you've identified a patient, and maybe you say you start treating them and, you know, whatever, whatever method you choose, mm-hmm. let, let's take it even a step further back and say, okay, so you have the discussion in the exam room mm-hmm. and, you know, you talk to the patient, you talk to the parents, and you say, this is what we want to do, and this is why. And the parent says, okay, that sounds great. What do you do, what are the next steps? What, you know, do you schedule that patient back in for a follow-up visit? Um, And do you do certain things at that visit? Uh, How long is that follow-up, how long does that follow-up visit take place? When do they come back in? What does that look like? Um, I think that also depends on the patient and what treatment option they're going for. But in terms of my initial, let's say I have a conversation with the parent and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm on board. I'm going to do, sometimes the parents are very nearsighted and they don't want their kid right. being like them. So they, that's when they really get it and, and they'll go right away. Um, depending on their evaluation and what treatment options um, the the docs at the myopia control center decide to go with, they'll maybe see them back in a few months or six months or that kind of thing. Um, I'll always see them back maybe at the six month point to just um, check up on them or the year. The patient will return Mm -hmm. and they return and you know, you're doing a refraction and all of a sudden their prescription's different. You know, maybe it changes, maybe it changes by a quarter, whatever that is. Maybe it's at the six month mark, maybe it's at the year mark and mom or dad says, oh, geez, you know, this isn't working. Yeah. What does that conversation then sound like? And is there a way of talking about myopia control in, in regards to, well, you know, the eyes still might change, but maybe they're not changing as rapidly. And, and how do you best express that? So, I mean, from the very beginning, there's no guarantee, and it's important to educate them about that. And you always want to kind of present the um, circumstance as, hey, there are th- this may prevent the progression of your child's nearsightedness and prevent them from acquiring these negative consequences in the future. But again, there is no guarantee. And, and yeah, they, they may still change. There's no real um, true stopping myopia indefinitely. It's, they're going to progress, but um, just not as much as they would have had we not done treatment. I guess it's more looking at the rate of change, maybe, than... Yeah. You know. um, and, you know, you mentioned that it's, it might still change. How long do you keep a patient on treatment for? Is it a, I mean, not a lifetime thing, but is there, you know, a certain number of years? Is it yeah. until you're 30 years old, 25, whatever it is? That's a great question. So, um, typically until they're about 18... And then um, after that, I mean, there's de- there are definitely orthokeratology lenses for adults, but at that point, the eye is pretty much developed in terms of axial length. It's not going to grow too, too much afterwards. So that's why we, I would say, up to 18. And atropine has been shown to be the most effective. Is that correct? I think the three methods we spoke about yeah. have all shown very good efficacy. Okay. I wouldn't say that one is better than okay. the other. Um, but diluted atropine diluted has been, atropine. yeah, 0.05% in particular has shown to be the most um, efficacious uh, out okay. of the diluted drops. Yeah. And is, is there maybe patients that you would say, you know what, we can't really use this on you? I mean, because in terms of accommodation, if you're 15, 16, I mean, you're in high school, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. And it, 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 is that a barrier? I think um, patients that come back very... Um, if they're complaining, like, hey, I really can't do right. my homework or that kind of thing, then we'd look at other options, such as a multifocal. Mm-hmm. So that's where it kind of depends on um, a case-by-case basis. And do you need to be comfortable with all three methods to practice this? Or is it something like, you know, for example, you might say, hey, you know what? I like the idea of using atropine, maybe soft uh, contact lenses, but ortho-K is a whole other animal. I mean, that's like, you're talking 
specialty lenses. You're talking about setting up an entire system for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And is that you know, is it? Do you have to do all three? Do you have to be familiar with all three? Or can you just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to focus on atropine. And if for some reason we can't pursue that, maybe I'm going to send that patient somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, it's really up to you and what you're comfortable with. If you don't have, um, you know, you can focus mostly on axial length and, and try just multifocal contact lenses. But you really want to make sure that you're able to take those axial length measurements, whether you're using an A-scan or a Pentacam or co-managing with somebody that has that. You really don't want to just be focusing on the numbers and whether that's changing because... Yeah, and you know, maybe just one more question here for you. And you hear about standard of care, and you know, myopia control is not the standard of care. Uh, right. Many would argue that it should be, right? And and you know, my opinion is that we should be doing something, you know, rather than just changing prescriptions year after year after year. Especially if we have this knowledge. Now that we have this knowledge, do you feel that maybe in the future it might become the standard of care? And that's a hard question to answer, but I hope so. I mean, I think as healthcare professionals, you want to be not just diagnosing, okay, goodbye, but educating them about this is what you need to look out for. This is how this could benefit you. These are the pros and cons. I mean, we're looking out for our patients, not just for the day they come in, but, you know, for their lives. If it's something we're aware of and something we can potentially um, help them out with, then I think, you know, that's our job. Yeah, like you said, it's not just about wearing glasses or contacts, but there's a lot of other uh, a lot of disease associated with this progression. And if exactly. we can do something to stop that, then we're doing a greater good. Yeah. So uh, if people want to reach out to you to ask yeah. you some questions, where's the best place they can contact you? Um, I am very big on Instagram. So you can find me at iDocArene. Um, and I'm pretty good at responding there. So. All right. There you have it. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having yeah. me. Appreciate it.